Sometimes when you're digging through fragments of silicon, you'll find a podcast. Welcome to uh, the first installment of the Fragments of Silicon, uh, the European interviews for the season. Well, I guess in this case, it's not really European because our guest is from Seattle, if I'm recalling correctly. Um, anyway, uh, this week we are welcoming Christopher Floyd of uh, Pillow Castle Games. Hello. Hello. Uh, how are you doing this morning? Good. Sun has still not fully risen in Seattle. It's actually pretty dark. Duly noted. Uh, anyway, how we'd like to get started is to get to know the person behind the game studio, what have you. And we do that by asking this question. What got you interested in video games, both on a personal and a professional level? Um, I guess was one of those things where growing up uh, I was a kid during the Sega match system time I grew up in Europe so I guess being on the Europe time probably is a good idea um, and yeah I loved playing video games my whole life always found them super interesting kind of seemed like the most uh, interesting medium to work in um, and then as time went on, you know, I'd spent so much time doing it that it sort of seemed like I should just do it for a job. <laughs> so that's how it ended up happening. Right. Well, a fairly common pathway. Um, how long ago did you arrive at that particular conclusion? Uh, working, working in the industry. Uh -huh. Um, let's see. It sort of it began in a little bit of like a um, like a crossing of a threshold kind of thing. I started off doing blogging. Um, I was I think I decided for whatever reason one day that I was going to start a blog and just review every game that I played that year. <laughs> and you know, as with like all good blogs, I think I did it maybe three times or something. Um, but I ended up working with a website called videogamewriters.com um, and did some writing for them. And then I ended up doing like a Sunday column where I was interviewing uh, predominantly independent game developers and posting interviews with them every Sunday. And um, then that eventually morphed into me doing some writing for other places. And then during that time, I started working at um, Vicarious Visions, which is like a Activision mm -hmm. studio in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and I worked for them for, I think, around a year, give or take. Um, uh -huh. And while I was working there, uh, I helped organize the Boston Festival of Indie Games um, that I think still exists. I, I haven't been on the East Coast in so long, but... Um, helped organize that for one year, and at the same time, or shortly after, or shortly before, um, I started helping out with uh, the Indie Mega Booth, mm. and that ended up I ended up leaving Vicarious Visions to join the Mega Booth, and I worked there for about give or take three four years, um, and then while I was working there, I actually ran my own podcast called the Indie Megacast, mm -hmm. and um, we, what was I going to say about that? Oh yeah, and then while I was doing that, I also set up a co-working space for game developers in Seattle, it's called Indie's Workshop, and then after three or four years of the Mega Blue stuff, um, I joined 
Radial Games, which is like a VR focused studio based in uh, Canada, but you know, like all everyone's kind of everywhere. Um, and yeah, worked there for about a year, I think. And then shortly after that, I started working on Superliminal. That's my entire life. <laughs> wow. Uh, so yeah, a lot of uh, gravitation towards indie games, I'm noting in that resume. Yeah, that was that was certainly. I mean, I think it works in two ways. One, uh, one like smaller teams and independent teams are easier to get in touch with and mm -hmm. you know, get speaking to. Um, <laughs> I guess three three senses. That was one. That was not the predominant reason. Two was that I really I, I just thought like at, especially at that time like that was two thousand two thousand ten. Mm-hmm. Give or take. Um, and the independent scene was just insanely good. Um, that was when like a lot of the studios that are now huge were just kind of starting to show off cool stuff. Like I think Bastion was out sometime around then. Um, and uh, the other part was that I thought it was kind of the like as well as enjoying the games. I always I, I used to um, play music in bands and stuff, and I always kind of liked the DIY aesthetic and i like the idea that um it was all kind of people just doing stuff that they wanted to do and it was like a little bit i think it's it probably still is a little bit more creative than the triple a side was um and yeah it, just, it seemed like a cool place to be and it remains a cool place to be <laughs> indeed yeah like i'd say outside of a year stint at activision uh, you uh certainly are um very active in the scene, whether it be, you know, on the writing side, the display side, or now the development side. Mm -hmm. and, um, I suppose narrowing in on the development, uh, what attracted you to Pillow Castle? Um, so basically, I let me see. I'm tr go trying to remember how this all falls together. Um, so, about a year, about a year prior to me, prior to me work, working with them properly, um, two of the developers were working out of my co-working office, mm -hmm. um, and I knew one of them pretty well. And the other one had, the other one had been there since like for like three or four years at that point, and then one had just joined in the last year. And I noticed that they were they were kind of having a bit of a rocky time uh, getting it made. Um, and, you know, with these things, like sometimes it's sometimes I think these things just resolve themselves, you know, and you kind of want to like keep an eye on things, see how it's going, but it's also like not, it's not your place to get involved, right? Um, so I kind of let it, I let it sit and it would, it would become like a, a topic of conversation in the office every now and then that people were kind of confused why this like really interesting premise for a game like kind of seemed like it was a little bit stuck um and then one night i called albert um who's the game director over to my apartment and we had a bit of a chat and i i sort of said um i want to work with you like for like a month um and just try to help you get stuff back on the straight and narrow and if it's good after that you know I, i'll work with you longer but you know it's like a no pressure arrangement you don't have to pay me or anything and he was like, okay, that sounds good. Cause I think people like it when you offer to pay, offer to do work for no pay. <laughs> um, at the end of that month, like we just, uh, I kind of helped him streamline a lot of stuff. Like I think just my general experience was higher than the rest of the team. Um, and it was going pretty well. And then I, that extended to like a three, a three month agreement. And then at the end of that three month agreement, I kind of joined the team properly more, like I'd previously been in more of like a consultant capacity. Right. And then we kind of went headlong into, into making this whole thing. Okay. And uh, can you de detail what the issue that Superliminal was facing at that particular moment in time? Yeah, I mean it's 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 kind of a mix of a bunch of things. Um, ultimately, it was because 
a lot of the team, well, I guess pretty much at that point, everybody on the team hadn't, they hadn't really tackled like a, a larger project like this. Um, uh, you know, everyone had plenty of experience doing their own things and like, you know, little projects and stuff like that, but nothing that was like, like not only like a larger, more ambitious project, but also pretty interesting to people, right? Like, I mean, for a team that really never did any marketing for the game, like all our trailers and videos <laughs> had like millions of views. It was pretty scary. Um, and so I think they were, they were kind of stuck in this thing where when you've got a lot of people interested in what you're doing, there's a lot of pressure to not get it, not do it wrong. Um, and not want to like deliver something that isn't, uh, you know, to like a, like an expected quality bar. Right. Um, and that, I think that was kind of, they were kind of trapped in this thing where, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like what they had was bad, but nothing felt like it was good enough. And they also weren't sure what way to go to make it better. Um, and I don't know if you guys have any experience of being like super hyper focused on something for a long time, but it becomes very difficult to actually find your way out of that maze. Um, and someone who is new to that situation and which in this case was me, it's just kind of easier for you to see cause you're kind of on the outside and you know, you like it's it to you. It's like glaringly obvious what all the props are, even though it's like impossible to see when you're in the middle of it. I just first answer the question. I mean, us, I can't think of anything that we would be uh, hyper focused on, but we've certainly heard the story before um, mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. developers. Um, because, yeah, um, work on a project taking a long time and just being ensconced by it is a fairly common uh, prerogative, especially on the indie scene. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think like the because it tends to have less of a focused schedule, it's easier to get mired in that stuff, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, how long uh, was Superliminal in development for? Oh, it, it really depends how you slice it, but somewhere between seven and five years. I gotta say, that's certainly a bit of a development cycle. <laughs> yeah, it's a but long time. But I'm assuming it, um, this is just not straight. You were, uh, y'all were just making the game, kind of. Exactly. Developed. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the way the way it divides up is, um, Albert, uh, if I mentioned the game director, he started working on it as a student project when he was at um, Carnegie Mellon, which I think is in Philadelphia. Is that right? I guess it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but uh, he was there and, you know, by the end of the project, he kind of thought it was pretty interesting and, mm -hmm. you know, everyone was graduating, all that kind of thing. So he kept the project, everyone else moved on. And he then started trying to figure out how to turn it into a real thing, uh, sort of slowly amassed, you know, one or two different people and everyone worked on it in little bits and pieces. Um, I think the guy I knew, Logan, who's who was our other designer. I think I think he joined it in something like 2015 or 2016, um, and then I kind of watched them working on it, and then I think I joined it in early 2018 or late 2017, something like that. Um, and so yeah, and so like I even like. I guess a good example there is that at that point, shortly after that, there was a big change in the team and we brought in, like some people left and we got in new people. And then fortunately that was the team that kind of stuck around to ship it. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was very much a case of like, you know, not, not necessarily seven years of uh, full-time development from the full team or even from one person, but um, kind of a lot of wandering around in the woods, <laughs> panicking about not being able to get out. Yeah, I can certainly see. Um, and uh, what was the thing or things that ended up uh, unlocking the project, as it were? You know, what drove the development forward at long last? 
Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I get, I mean, I guess it's kind of a mix of things, but um, the first kind of motivating factor was running out of money, which is always good for like putting a fire under stuff. Um, but when I joined again, I think cause I had a little bit more experience and had worked on, you know, like when I worked at Vicarious Visions, like, you know, that was a team of like 200 odd people. So, um, I was kind of used to being part of like a larger machine and figuring stuff out. And, um, I, I we, we kind of started, I started, like, I kind of introduced a lot of like structure to the project and like finding ways to take what was there and make it feel like a more cohesive whole. Um, and then also like finding, finding those, those new people for the team really helped. Cause like one bringing in fresh, fresh eyes on the stuff was great because they just had all these really good ideas and like uh, Steve Allen, who was the art director um, on the project when we hired him, like he was, he is like an insane uh, career history, but like what, the, the most significant thing for us was that he'd worked on Bioshock um, and yeah. hit the way, like, I think, I honestly think it was like something like within like a week or two of him joining the team, he'd like built out this, really awesome like a thing which we ended up not using at all but it was just like it was such a great visionary piece that we were like okay this is this is gonna be fine now like this just looks so neat um and i mean i think it comes through a lot in the finished product product like it just looks great good to hear good to hear so um how many people ended up working on the let's say um modern or finished version of superliminal yeah, I like modern as a term. That's funny. Um, I guess it was something like a. It was. I mean, the full time team was five people, mm -hmm. uh, and then we had some people uh, coming in on various things. Like um, our our friend Alex, you know, he helped towards the end for like a month or two. Uh, Phil joined the project shortly before that, and he's one of the ones who's still pretty active now that even after we've shipped because he's just an incredibly smart engineer and fixes everything for us. <laughs> um, right. uh, but yeah, day to day for like those kind of final two years, it was me, Albert, Logan, Steve, and then our other artist, uh, Ryan Sanderson. Mm -hmm. A fairly typical indie team size. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, Very much. Like, and, um, well, and so that's some of the developments, but I suppose we should uh, shift gears a bit here and actually talk about the game itself um sure. so i guess we should start with the title here um what is super liminal what, what is super limin liminality <laughs> super liminality um yeah so i mean the the title is i mean i i, I liked it for a couple of reasons one <laughs> one like half jokingly but I think having super in a video game title is just funny, especially when it's not uh, like, you know, some sort of Nintendo game. Um, <laughs> so uh, super liminal then, I mean, refers to the concept of like, um, so subliminal is stuff that's like below the level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Liminal is things that happen in, the, in your like conscious space. It's like what you're aware of. And then super liminal is like, above that level um and i kind of kind of thought that was like an, a, a cool evocative word i like i also really like one word titles i think it helps uh makes things punchy and uh it was like and it was like weirdly it's like evocative in a way where you probably have never used the term superliminal in your life but you kind of immediately get what it means does that make sense um i, I suppose so Though, uh, you know, from what I've been able to discern from, like, the game itself, it's kind of, it's got a double meaning, because it's not just uh, consciousness, because, you know, uh, for those who might not know the narrative of the game, um, you are a person who's basically exploring their dreamscape um, for the purposes of uh, psychological healing. Um, and, but it's all framed in the world of art and liminality has a meaning in that world, you know, limited spaces. And we're, we're seeing a lot of that here, a play, 
a lot of playing with perspective, size, what have you. Um, where did that um, game mechanic come from? Um, so the the very like you know it's it's always tricky. I think I think people who haven't played the game don't necessarily realize that the resizing thing is like sort of just one thing that happens, right? Like there's lots of other weird little wonderful things we have, but um, the resizing was it was it was probably I think it's the very original like concept of the game, like the sort of thing that was made within the first weekend that you know on the back on the back end of it changed a lot over the course of development, but as a gameplay thing remained there the whole time. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, like the I guess the the driving force behind all that stuff was just it was kind of i mean th this is a good re good example of sort of what made the the project hard to work on but because we were basing it in a in like an unreality mm -hmm. but we wanted it we wanted it to feel like it like it did we didn't want it to feel like super like you know trippy and crazy dream world um like we do that towards the end of the game we didn't want the whole game to feel like that um and so the sort of the constant question was like, what's a thing that we could do that would be really weird and really cool, but also um, like fun, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then because we kind of wanted to like pack it with all these like interesting things, we would we would sort of you know like one of the one of the hard parts of the game from a development perspective was we would spend a lot of time working on these things and then we would only use them would be like once or twice um and it's kind of funny because like now i see people uh like when we get steam reviews and stuff often people will talk about how they wish there was like more use of the mechanics and i think it's you know it's 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 cool to hear but at the same time it's like sort of i think like that to us was like sort of the antithesis of the whole concept because like we just wanted we wanted to just like throw you into a room, nothing makes sense, something happens, and you're like, oh, cool, and then you just never see that thing again. <laughs> so, so you're like, so you're constantly kind of on your toes, right? Um, and so, like, the the question was always, like, how do we, like, does this thing we want to do fit? Like, we, we have a lot of mechanics that didn't make it into the final game um, because we really, like, wanted to, like, I don't know what you call that term, like, I guess, cut, but, like, with a sharp knife, can it go through everything and say, like, is this really great, or is it just kind of a cool thing? Because we should we should focus on the stuff that's really great. Um, I think the terminology you're looking for is cadence and flow. Sure. Like, because, uh, yeah, uh, that's a very uh, Nintendo way of uh, making a game. As say, you introduce a game mechanic, and instead of it being your core... Um, it's there for a usage or two, and you move on to the next one. You know, and th that is a valid way of making a game. You know, it's like not everything has to be, you know, I, I, to cite one of the ov obvious examples of inspiration, like Portal. Like, Portal is uh -huh. uh, completely built around the, the portals and the portal right. gun. Um, and, you know, that's one approach, and this game took another one. Um but you do see certain motifs up here every, you know, like uh, the resizing is definitely more than used once or twice. Yes. Yeah, it's it's certainly like the core mechanic, I guess you would say. Yeah, um, and what was the trickiest one of those to come up with, if you can detail it without like spoiling things? Yeah. Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean. Honestly, like I think the trickiest, each each thing, almost everything we do in the game, by and large, is way more complicated, you know, it, behind the scenes than it actually is when you're seeing it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think, like there's <laughs> there's there's kind of a there's a reason, you know, in hindsight, there's a good reason that a lot of this stuff has never been done in games before because <laughs> they're hard to. Do. Um, so like every, every I mean almost everything was like technically quite complicated. Um I'm trying uh -huh. to think of which one we Oh, you know what? I mean, I guess the best example is probably the one that the one that's still to this day really hard for people to to like figure out is um we have a there's a hallway puzzle 
near the like sort of two thirds point of the game, um, mm-hmm. when you're coming, you're, you're you come to a, like a fork in a hallway, and you can go left or go right, and the hallways numbered hallway one, and if you successfully get to the next hallway, it, it moves up to hallway two, and if you choose the wrong hallway, you go back to hallway one, and it's completely unclear why that's happening. Right. Um, and it's it, there is like a there is some sort of decoration around, uh, like preceding that 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 sort of is supposed to guide you in the right direction. But part of that idea was like that was like I remember Logan I think referred to that as like the boss battle <laughs> of the game because <laughs> it's like it's like a really hard puzzle that you will like you'll it's kind of thing like you'll either like see it and immediately know or you will end up like smashing your head against the wall trying to figure it out. Um, and so that was one where like, we really, that went through so many revisions. And I think even like, it's one of the weird things about working in like modern video games, but like the idea that you can patch games, right? So people are constantly like, you know, adjusting the balance of guns or whatever and things like that. But we were patching the puzzles over the course of like the year following release. Um, and that puzzle I think has gone through something like three revisions it's always the same core puzzle but trying to find ways to kind of um hint hint like sort of guide you in the right direction without it without it becoming too linear you know right right uh and it becoming too easy right yeah exactly like i mean at a certain point then you'd just be like oh it's just a weird corridor which is (laughs) which is like would be a a too far well and uh, that would change the nature of the game like, um, and uh, on, on that note, um, is this uh, superliminal game? Um, is it? Is its narrative? Is its aesthetics? Is it all just in service of the gameplay here, or are you trying to tell a story as well, like an actual story? Um, I mean, there is a story there. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know which of you has played the game or whatever, but um, the like one of the kind of guiding principles behind the whole project, which again was like you know was hard to do, but I think we pulled it off pretty well. I mean, the, given the response, but um, was to make to make everything as cohesive as possible. Um, I think that's kind of like the highest achievement in a video game is when you can really like have every discipline. Uh, linked together like mm-hmm. conception um and so like the story of the game is you know the, there's like sort of what you said the psychological healing you know it's more the idea of you know it's like someone's having sleep problems they go to like a sleep clinic um they're in some kind of like induced dream and then they're like trying to find their way out right so like the escape thing is you know i guess you could draw parallels to portal with there right because i mean yeah. After about halfway through Portal, that's what you're doing. Um, and at the same time, we we sort of are also telling this other story mm. uh, that's more about, like, it's kind of, how do you put it? Like, there's the story that you're being fed, which is like we have these uh, audio cues, like you run into these little uh, speaker boxes and they you're communicating with the guy who's running the test. And... Then on like a more subliminal level, LOL, um, we are telling telling a story about you, the player, that you're just that you're just kind of not aware of until towards the end, mm-hmm. um, and then we kind of tie the whole thing up and set you on your way, and I'm, I think. The high praise for that. I remember. I remember there was a point where. So we have like an ending montage sequence um, mm-hmm. before before the very end, and that was a thing that Logan and I worked on really closely uh, for a long time throughout the game. Oh, we also have. I guess I should mention we have a developer commentary in there. So um, there's lots of stuff to glean out of the game if you if you do check it out. Um, mm-hmm. But we worked on that for a long time and. I remember I remember the day that Lo- I came in on like a Monday and Logan told me he had played the most recent version of the montage that 
um, we've been putting together, and it like made him, like not not exactly tear up, but like he like felt that like lump in his throat, and he was like, oh my god, I think we've actually like I think it's good now, like <laughs> we've made it work, um, <laughs> and we've had lots of people you know sort of say they finished the game and were like crying and applauding at the credits, which is really cool. I mean that's that's about the best thing you can hear. It's a good a good time to hear someone is crying, I guess. I'd say so, especially given the amount of time that uh, was put into this project. Like, yeah, yeah, I could definitely see why there would be uh, an emotional climax. Let's say. Like, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm also if we didn't want to be, we didn't want to be too heavy-handed about it. Like, I I think sometimes uh, in games there's like a propensity to kind of go from like you know, hyper intense action to like immediately very intense emotion. It's, it's, it's kind of an unearned response. Mm -hmm. um, and so we wanted to do, like I said, we want to do something that was a little bit more subtle. And again, something that you don't realize that this whole thing is like, like, how do we describe it? Like, we can describe it as like people, people play Superliminal as themselves. Like you don't play as a character, like you are you playing the game. Um, right. And that, that becomes a lot more clear towards the end. And I think that's kind of neat. <laughs> I, think, I think it worked out. It was it was really hard at the time. It's again in the process, and when you don't have anyone to play test with because you're kind of fighting to get all these systems working, it's hard to tell if you've got it right, and all you really have is your gut. And so it was rewarding at the end to find out that that did happen. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Uh... And it sounds like the uh, player response to Superliminal here has been uh, pretty good. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, it was it was funny because, like, again, you know, I think it probably sounds silly in hindsight, but we just didn't know if anyone was going to care. Um, uh -huh. You know, like one of the big fears with the game having been in development for such a long time was, you know, what if everyone has kind of moved on, right? Um, the the hype for the hype for games doesn't tend to last about seven years, not commonly. But, um, you kind of have about six months, I think, to show up and anyone to care about you, and then they slowly forget you exist because so many other games are coming out, and you know, attention just goes elsewhere. Um, so the big the big fear was that we would kind of do all this stuff and then find out that there was like no one who wanted to play it or cared. Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately, the response was like kind of the total opposite. Um, I think I think it was interesting because like when we, if you go back and see, there's like a Polygon article from something like 2014 uh, that links that initial video. And mm -hmm. at that point, at that point, sort of the like the major enthusiast press like IGN and all that kind of stuff you know we're going crazy over the video and like oh my god this game looks gonna be amazing and then when the game came out the response from them wasn't nearly as strong as the response we got from users um like our player our player base just responded super strongly and it's it's still um it's a it's a crazy and weird thing that every time I log into Twitter there's like someone talking about you know how they've just played the game and had a really good time with it or whatever um and that's that's like so uncommon you know in unfortunately in the it, with the amount of games that come out these days it's so difficult to stand out and we didn't we didn't assume we would have any more chance than anyone else um so it's it's nice that it worked out although i you know i have no idea what how we cracked the code, so. i think uh, like i think i can offer some insight like um you're this game is walking a very tight rope that i think ultimately it succeeded like it's definitely familiar like i can huh? see not just say portal but like say the stanley parable and um uh, architect um uh, other first person puzzle or narrative uh, adventure games in this style so there's definitely a frame of reference. But on the other hand, it's also got um, a unique hook. Like um, the re I know it's not the only gameplay gimmick going on here, but okay, it's but I'll, I'll, I'll forgive you on that. It's, it's pretty common that it gets yeah. lifted that way. 
Well, it, it, it's also I don't want to spoil what else is in the game. Yeah, okay. sure. But you know, it's something that stands out. It's something that's noticeable immediately, and you know, it gives it an identity all its own. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are other factors um, therein, and it also, let's say, dumb luck. You know, like <laughs> I think dumb luck is way more significant than. <laughs> yeah. my but and another one I think is also the context uh, of first release because uh, if I'm recalling correctly, the first platform this game released on was on uh, the Epic Game Store, like, um, which is a highly curated platform and doesn't have a lot of games on it, so it's a lot easier to stand out uh, as opposed to say Steam, where you know it's just hundreds and hundreds of games getting released like a day. Yeah, that is that's very true. Yeah. You know, plus, um, I'm sure Epic helped in the hyping up of the game uh, uh, in like the weeks before release and whatnot. Like, so, you know, it, it's all about context. I think. Like, um, anyway. So after the initial release, this game came to consoles, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, yeah. Did you guys uh, create the console versions, or did another company uh, contract out for it? Yeah, um, so we worked with uh, actually a, a, a local porting team uh, named Play Everywhere. Um, ah. I'd known uh, Thomas O'Connor, who runs that team for like a number of years, and we actually had we we had a funny we had a, a friend a colleague who used to work in the office with us who ended up working for them. So there was a little bit of like, uh, overlap. Um, mm -hmm. but so, yeah, so it was predominantly them working on it with us sort of like, I guess like overseeing it, right. Like figuring out things like, you know, how to, like what to delete to make it run on switch, you know, it was like, uh, like one of the things we had to solve, like they weren't, you know, to, like to their credit, they weren't in the business of like, editing the game for us you know they wanted to be like hey we'll get, we'll get it working just let us know what you want to get working and um i suppose to that end uh, what compromises did you end up doing to the switch version um, well yeah i mean the thing was we were we were <laughs> it's we went into the switch version or went into the console versions entirely kind of unsure if they were going to be worth it like uh -huh. there's kind of there's there's an there's ongoing theme in the development where like we never believe it's ever going to work out, <laughs> and it does. But um, there was a long we had long conversations among us about um, was it like was it going to be worth it, right? Because it was going to cost money to port it, and uh, it was you know it was risk that we weren't sure was going to pay out. And what if no one cares? And it's like such a weird game for console. You know, it's like it was a very you know I think it's clear it's a very pc apparent game like the games you reference you know are, are all pretty strongly associated with pcs right um, and <clears throat> i remember at the time i was looking at i was looking at the switch charts this was probably oh my gosh like maybe like february 2018 2019 or something um 2019 probably and a lot of the a lot of the titles in the top 10 were first person games, which there aren't that many off on Switch, but also all of the first person games were huge franchises. Like it was like Skyrim, Doom, mm -hmm. uh, there was something else there that I forget. But anyway, but like those were the two where I was like, well, if we do as well as Doom and Skyrim, we'll be all right. But I also don't think that's going to happen. But um, so we kind of went in there going, okay, well, we'll see what we can get working. It's entirely possible that like a lot of the graphic stuff we're doing is going to be impossible to pull off. Um, and it actually ended up, it all worked out. All we had to do with the Switch version essentially was turn the graphic settings down. Um, we, we managed to get away with almost everything that we have in the PC version, which was uh, really surprising and a big uh, endorsement of Play Everywhere's work on it. Oh, that's good. Uh, uh, you know, um, the Switch is a fairly capable machine, um, in spite of its hardware limitations. I mean, yeah, I agree. It's impressive. You know, I mean, they've gotten things like The Witcher Three and um, 
you know, Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal working on it. So Yeah, I actually just played through Doom Eternal over the holiday break. And I mean, certainly, like, when you look at The Witcher 3 and Doom Eternal on Switch, they don't yeah. look the same as the versions on PC. No, um, no. I, no, I, I, I'm not saying that they're uncompromised or anything, but they run, and they run, relatively easily. speaking, well. Yeah, no. it's, it is. It's a testament to how powerful like mobile chips have become that mm -hmm. those are feasible at all, right? Yeah, I mean it's not, not just power, but I I suspect it's also architectural and um, talents. Yeah, you know, there there are some Switch ports that didn't work out so well. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm looking at you, the troll and I. <laughs> I. I haven't heard of that. What's what's the issue? Everything. <laughs> you can look it up. It, it, it's it, it, it's unplayable. It, oh my just gosh, quite frankly, okay. it, it it's infamously unplayable in Switch circles. Um, anyway, uh, you know, I suppose maybe a more recent and uh, big league example is the Outer Worlds. Like, didn't quite pull that one off. Like, but. Uh, once again, it, it's kind of impressive that it's running at all on the Switch. Given yeah, absolutely. And I'm just thinking, like, Outer Worlds is such a, like, like the idea of trying to make, I mean, I guess it's, you know, we see it with Skyrim and The Witcher too, but um, trying to get open world games on hardware like that is so, is so hard. I remember when I was first playing through Skyrim on Switch, um, it was kind of it, it. It surprised me how long it took me to notice because I mean the game is still pretty immersive, right? Like Skyrim is is successful and for, for a reason. Um, but once you realize that as you walk forward outdoors, you can just look at the horizon and watch everything being drawn on the screen. It's, like it's kind of funny where you're like, okay, let's. I mean, it's reassuring because you're like, okay, even sort of the the best, most like successful developers can't get the stuff to behave. So, right. The, the bar is lowered. I, I mean, I think I think in, to some extent I should underscore here that I think our Switch version is pretty close to the PC version. It's not as immediately different. Of um, course. As like you know, again because of the because of the decisions we made with art direction, you know, the game was always designed to look pretty like I guess you would call it like flat or muted, you know. So we didn't have to worry about like I think the big one I remember seeing with The Witcher Three was the difference in the water, how the water looks. Right. Um, and again, it's incredibly cool that they got it on Switch at all. But, you know, when you're looking at the two side by side, you, one of them is clearly a, a prettier version. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's also something like Super Liminal here is very, very linear, very corridor based. Ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just not as resource intensive. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and the, the thing is, like I said, the resources that we're using are all gameplay based. Like the, mm -hmm. like whenever you're holding an object, there's like a lot of stuff happening every single like microsecond <laughs> while you're holding that object. Right. Um, that you know when you're I don't know holding a sword in The Witcher or whatever, it doesn't really matter as much. Mm -hmm. At any rate, um, so how how successful were the console versions ultimately? Um, pretty successful. I mean, we were the number five game on switch mm. uh, that, that weekend we came out um that was actually i mean over the holidays <coughs> pardon me over the holidays we had an email from nintendo to let us know we were one of the best selling games that they had that year and they made like a little art graphic for us um mm. uh like i mean it was it was crazy to look at we we're i'm looking at the graphic now we're like alongside you know hades um, Among Us, which you may have heard of. <laughs> um, it was crazy. I mean, it's it's the, the response was way stronger than we expected, and I mean, we were very happy about it. But then it also like all of these things constantly felt like they were like the you're sort of waiting for the gotcha moment, and then right. this was all leading up to the Steam launch, and we thought, oh god, this this is going to be the one where you know, like the one that we're kind of most scared off is going to end up being the one that doesn't work, you know? And uh, again, it was, the response was pretty mind-blowing. Mm. And now, if I'm recalling correctly, the Steam and, uh, is this game on GOG yet? Yep, it is. It came out day and date with Steam. 
Okay. Yeah, that came out in uh, November, which is a very busy time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, like you know, that was that that's a good example of um, when we were when we were planning the release mm -hmm. with uh, with Epic, we wanted to be out by November. I think that I mean there were good reasons for it at the time. And to be clear, Epic had no like they had no involvement on it. We were just planning with them, because right. um, obviously you want to get like. Like you were saying, you like you want to find a week when no one else is launching, and you know, so they can give you the attention that you want. And I think at that point we were between. Oh God, it was something really scary. Like the Star Wars game from Respawn was coming out the week after us, so like we shifted our date up a week, which kind of sounds like not a lot, but when you're scrambling to finish the game, it's pretty scary. Right. Um, so we launched into that November period, and that went really well. Like I think we were top three or top four on the Epic Store for a while. Um, mm -hmm. And then, like, it's something I keep saying to people, I'm like, never, like, firstly, never launch your game in November, and secondly, don't launch it twice in November either. Um, <laughs> but, like, then we got, like, a year through, because I guess also you can then draw a parallel to, like, we launched on consoles in July, which is, again, like, traditionally the sort of quietest time to launch a game. Like, no one's everyone's waiting for the holiday period, right? Right. Um, and then we launch on Steam. Uh, that was in the 5th of November, I think. Um, and you're just like, you know, th that's when like all all the marketing machines are like spinning up and on full full blast. Plus, at, I, mean, I mean, again, like credit, credit to Epic. At that point, we realized, so we launched Epic in November 12th, 2019. Um, right. We're obviously, like, the plan was launch on Steam November 12th, 2020. And then we realized that the PS5 was coming out that day. <laughs> and then we were like, okay, cool. I mean, it's just like, it just felt like, okay, well, eventually something was going to get us, and this is going to be the one that gets us. And uh, I spoke to like our contact at Epic, and he was like, "Oh God, that seems terrible. Why don't you guys just launch it a week early?" And I was like, "Well, are you sure? Because we have this agreement with you." And he was like, "No, no, just do it." Um, and so that really helped. You know, it meant that we had a little bit of breathing space that week before on Steam. Even though, like, I think I think th there's a lot of fear of uh, console stuff for people developing on Steam, but I think predominantly a lot of the players on Steam aren't. I, they aren't following console stuff nearly as closely as I think developers are because they're, you know, worrying about everything. Um, yeah. Plus, yeah. Um, you know, in real terms, the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X have been severely uh, supply constrained. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I guess in some ways maybe that helped us because then everyone was forced to just play Super Liminal because they had all, all this money laying around and nothing to do with it. Um, but, well, yeah, but I mean, it worked out. Like, it was... It was it was really crazy. We like because you know when you launch the game on Steam, like you just click a button on the the back end of the website, and yeah. it kind of feels like nothing has happened. <laughs> and then you're sort of refreshing your your store page like crazy, and then like finally you see that it's launched, and that's it. Like you have no idea, right? Because I think it, it I, I think there's some sort of sensible time delay between you know when anyone's going to review the game, like just from like a they have to play it and finish it first, and then also like Steam has a little time delay before it goes out. Um, so we're kind of sitting there going, oh god, like I I think it's worked, but we have no idea. Uh, hope it goes well. And then I think two hours later we noticed we were in the top sellers thing, and we were like, okay, let's go have lunch because like now it seems like it's okay. And we, we don't have to worry about it so much. Uh, that's good. Also, your launch precipitated uh, was before the um, Steam sale. You know, the, the big Steam winter sale. And yes, which is also stupid. Like, yeah, we, so many bad things happen. <laughs> Potentially, but also really good things can happen. Um, you know, how was the Steam sale for you? Uh, very, very good. Oh, yeah, sorry. I guess I realize, I realize now you're talking about the winter sale. Um, so yes, the other yes. thing was we were, we were launching just before the autumn sale. Um, yeah. So, you know, again, traditionally, anyone who's been on Steam for more than a year, I think, is pretty aware of these seasonal sale dates. You know, like, they, if they don't know when the dates are exactly, they know what's going to happen at some point, you know, each season. Um, right. we, people are 
people are pretty price sensitive. They tend to be waiting for sales to happen. And so when I was, when we were organizing our steam release, you know, I was talking to our, our contact at steam about it and saying, you know, it's basically like, what's the day that how, like, when do we release the game that means that we can be part of a sale, like particularly the winter sale. Cause it, if we miss out on that, I think it'll be really bad. Right. And you know, he was like, well, six, you know, six weeks is the thing. So, um, you know, I think at that point he was like, yeah, you'd have to do like somewhere before mid November. And then, you know, this all, all the story kind of folds together of like the PS five stuff and talking to Epic and everything. Um, and so then we did the winter sale and we kind of thought again, similarly, you know, we we're like, well, we're just out and you know, it's, it's weird. Cause like we're just out, but we're, we've also been out for a year at that point. Cause we've been on the Epic store. Um, right. So you don't really know or don't really want to count on like, is that going to do anything? Um, and is anyone going to care? And then, yeah. And then like the winter sale was just insane. It was like eye wateringly successful. I mean, our, our biggest worry for so long was, um, I was like really obsessed with us getting a, an overwhelmingly positive on steam. Like I just, it's like, I was like, you know, it's like all, all my friends have it. I want to have it too. Um, <laughs> and we were like watching, you know, I think like during that initial period, like the short sort of first maybe two weeks, I think of launch, mm -hmm. you know, we were getting like maybe something like 30 reviews a day. Like it was, it was, it was slow, but steady. Like we were getting lots of positive reception. It felt nice. It's like, okay, I think people care about the game. Um, and then around, gosh, I don't know when it was like, early December, I think they, they announced the Steam Awards and, right. um, you know, we were like, fingers crossed, we'll get most innovative gameplay. Cause the, that's kind of what we, what we've done the most. Um, and our reviews went through the roof. Like, I think we had something like 500 reviews in a day or something. And then that just continued through the period. Then they closed the nominations and then the steam sale happened and then it all happened again. And I could, you know, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of complex systems in steam that I, I don't think anyone knows how they work apart from steam. But, you know, I, I think that, I think that when a game is getting lots of reviews, it tells steam to show other people the game probably. Um, and then, so yeah, that it's was all, like, yeah, it's all uh, logarithmically uh, driven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like folding in, like, you know, so like more people give reviews, which shows the game to more people who then give it more reviews. And so it kind of became this, like, uh, very positive feedback loop. And uh, yeah, so it was good. So we were pretty happy with how things turned out. Indeed. And I suppose looking forward is the next step for Superliminal, um, the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5. It's pretty likely um, we're looking at that right now. You know, again, as, as hard as it is for consumers to get those next gen consoles, it is also hard for developers to get them too. Um, so we're, we're hoping to bring it to those consoles soon, but like, I'm not even being clever about that. Like, I don't know when soon is hopefully it'll be, you know, this year, but um, I just have to wait to get all the stuff and get it all lined up. I think if I remember right, I think it works automatically already but we kind of want to like we want to you know provide some like sort of graphical improvements and things now that we can take advantage of the extra power right i i mean i i'm i'm wondering how much of the extra power that superliminal can take advantage of because you know it's a first person puzzle game um uh -huh. so, you know like 120 uh FPS, it isn't probably going to improve the puzzles all that much. You know, I'm sure yeah, it would look nicer, yeah. but yeah. yeah, again, again, it's it, it's stuff that can seem surprising. But like I said, there's a lot of stuff going on in the back end of the game that is all very like physics based, and so more power in the console lets us do, uh, it gives us an easier time with how that stuff works. Like there's, as with all these things, like the, the console versions are like slightly reduced scope versions of what's happening in the PC version, because in a PC, we just have a lot more to play with. Right. And um, I suppose my final question for uh, you is, I don't know if you can go into it, but uh, do you have 
any ideas beyond super liminal. Like um, you mentioned a whole bunch of cut concepts. Yeah. You know, would you be looking at a super liminal too? Yeah, maybe. I mean, honestly, right now we have no idea. We uh, <laughs> like lo the sort of pro the time window between probably let's say a month before launching on Epic, so like October 2019 until December of 2020, which is what is that like? 12, 13, 14 months or something. Um, it was such an insanely crazy amount of like time and work that uh, right now we're <laughs> we're predominantly focused on like catching our breath and figuring out what we want to do next. Um, you know, it would it would be it would be remiss of me to say that no one's discussed the idea of a superliminal too. Um, but also, we like I think I I would like to think it comes through hopefully in the game, but like we are very like idea focused like we have lots of like things that are like the, the the last like the last three months maybe of the game of the game's development was focused on trying to stop thinking about other things you wanted to do and just like finishing this one because towards the end you're just like oh man i want to do literally anything else like i'm so tired from working on this game so um we're we're unsure what will happen next but you know i would be very surprised if we never do anything again. Let's put it that way. Right. I, I get what you're saying. And now I'll see if my colleagues here have any questions for you. I think I'm good. I've been playing the game um, live on the stream. It's it's interesting. I'll go with that. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any questions uh, from you, Petty? No, not that I can think of. All right. All right then. Um, well, uh, yeah, I guess that's about it. Uh, so, Chris, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule, especially given um, your location and the power. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. problem. This is this is no kidding. The earliest I've gotten up this year. So, thank you for <laughs> thank you for that opportunity. Yeah, you know, I'll note the year is only what fifteen days. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I'm. There are plenty of opportunities, you know, going forward. But we'll see. anyway, um, so the game is super liminal. Um, it's currently available for pretty much every available platform, um, and um, uh, uh, worth noting, like the Steam version uh, is that uh, Mac, Linux, and Windows. Correct. Yep. It's 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 Linux. The only place you can get it on Linux is Steam. It's PC and Mac everywhere else, and right. I think that covers it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's currently retailing for twenty dollars. Um, you can also get the soundtrack on Steam for seven dollars ninety nine, or a combined package uh, twenty two dollars thirty eight cents. Um, Thank you. That's good. You didn't know. Mm-hmm. Um, so be sure to pick it up today. Um, and if you enjoyed our interview today, be sure to um, subscribe and click the notification bell. You know, do all the things you got to do uh, to keep abreast things. Um, anyway, that'll about do it for, for this installment of Fragments of Silicon. Be sure to tune in on for our Sunday reviews. And until then, I shall wish you good gaming. <laughs>